Here we're going to discuss the molecular structure of sodium channels and how that structure can explain the operation of the channels observed in neurophysiological experiments. In the previous sections, we discussed the features that characterize ion channels as shown by electrophysiological studies. Sodium channels, for example, have three main parts. An activation gate that opens with depolarization. An inactivation gate that closes immediately after, even though the cell is still depolarized. And a pore through which the sodium ions flow when the activation gate is open. Electrophysiological studies, however, cannot show the structural underpinnings of the channel. Since each channel is a protein, we will examine the molecular structure of a channel, its complement of amino acids, and how the arrangement of amino acids in the different parts of the channel enables the channel to operate in a way consistent with its behavior revealed in voltage claim studies. But before turning to the structures of ion channels, a brief review of amino acids and proteins will be helpful. All amino acids have a central carbon atom that is covalently bonded to four molecular groups. A hydrogen atom, an amino group, a carboxyl group, and a variable group called an R group. The R stands for residue. The differences among amino acids result from the different R groups bound to each amino acid. Individual amino acids are linked together to form polypeptide chains by peptide bonds in which the carboxyl group of one amino acid is attached to the amino group of the next. Proteins made of a single chain of amino acids are called polypeptides. A small polypeptide composed of four amino acids, each with a different residue or R group, is shown at the bottom of the figure. The red circles indicate the residue of each amino acid. There are 20 amino acids that are used to build proteins. The five shown in the top panel have strongly hydrophobic residues, that is their water hating. Stretches of hydrophobic residues therefore tend to be found in the portions of the ion channels that are embedded in the lipid membrane. The portions of these proteins that are embedded in the membrane are called the transmembrane segments of the protein. The seven amino acids shown in the middle panel have strongly hydrophilic or water-loving residues. Stretches of amino acids with hydrophilic residues are more likely to be located in regions of the protein that extend into the extracellular or intracellular fluids. As the protein molecule is being synthesized, the polypeptide chain can coil into a spiral-like configuration called an alpha helix. And I want to make a point about this. And the point is that a group of 20 contiguous amino acids comprises a length of about 30 microns along the helix, which is the thickness of a cell's membrane. It therefore follows that a group of about 20 contiguous hydrophobic amino acids are transmembrane segments of the protein. Next, we consider how these features spin together to show the structure of an ion channel. We turn first to the sodium channel because it was the first channel that was cloned and whose amino acid sequence was first determined. The sodium channel protein is composed of about 2,000 amino acids, and it is the product of a single gene. As a first step in evaluating how the channel is structurally and functionally organized, a hydrophobicity plot is generated. Each amino acid is placed in the plot as it occurs in the protein, and each is assigned a hydrophobicity value which reflects its ability to interact with water. A running average of these values over several amino acids is then calculated around each amino acid in the protein sequence and plotted as a function of position along the protein chain. 
keep in mind that a sequence of about 20 hydrophobic amino acids would span the cell membrane and represents a transmembrane segment. The hydropathic index is plotted on the y-axis, where positive numbers indicate greater hydrophobicity and negative numbers indicate greater hydrophilicity. Notice the colored peaks, each of which is composed of about 20 or 25 amino acids. Let's look at the peaks from amino acid 1300 to 1600. With a little imagination, you can see six peaks. And thus, the peaks comprise six transmembrane segments. Each segment is numbered from one to six and is shown above by the colored block. If one considers the entire plot, there is a repeating pattern such that a series of six peaks is repeated four times. Each series of six peaks is called a domain of the channel, and since there are four repeats, the channel has four domains. One, two, three, four. The linear arrangement of the segments in each of the four domains, as they occur in the membrane, is shown in the lower part of the slide. If you look at one domain, say domain one, you can see the six segments, each labeled by an S with a number from one to six. Each segment in the domain is linked to its neighboring segment by an intra or extracellular linker of hydrophilic amino acids. In addition, each of the four domains is separated from its neighbor domain by a short intracellular hydrophilic segment. Notice that the hydrophilic stretches of amino acids are not embedded in the membrane, but rather are in the extra or intracellular fluids and link the transmembrane sections. But I would like to point out a few important features of the various segments. The first point is that the S4 segment in each of the four domains has positive charges. It contains mostly hydrophobic residues, but there are also positively charged residues located on every third amino acid. Notice it is the only segment with positive charges, and as we shall see, it is the segment that acts as the voltage sensor that operates the activation gate when the cell depolarizes. The second most important point is the intracellular loop between segments S6 in domain 3 and S1 in domain 4. This loop forms the inactivation gate that automatically closes after the activation gates open when the cell is depolarized. Finally, the third point is the loop between segment S5 and S6, labeled core. This is the loop that forms the actual core through which ions flow when the activation gate is open. So we're going to consider how each of these features works below. But I first need to point out that the domains are not arranged linearly, as they're shown in this figure. This slide shows both the linear arrangements of the four domains at the top and an expanded version of one domain in the middle panel. S4, the voltage sensor, and the core loop are highlighted. Now look at the bottom panel. Here the arrangement of the segments and the domains is not stretched out linearly in the membrane. Look at the channel on the left. The four domains are folded, each next to the neighbor, to form a circular ring. The channel on the right is shown in cross-section, and only two domains are shown. The voltage sensors on S4 are shown, as is the gate on the lower portion of the channel. The channel also has a central core formed by the core loop. There is also a part labeled selectivity filter right there. 
This is the part of the for loop that confers ion specificity, in this case, to sodium ions. We consider the operation of the selectivity filter in more detail in the next movie on potassium channels. Now that we know the structural features of the sodium channel, let's explore how these features spin together to make the channel operate in the way seen in voltage plant experiments. We first consider the operation of the activation gate and then turn to the inactivation gate. So here's the sodium track and let's explore how it operates. We can begin with the cell at rest when the activation gate is closed. When the cell is depolarized and the inside of the cell gains positive charges, the positive charges act to repel the positively charged helix of the S4 segments and displace them upward into the extracellular space. The net effect is to cause the S4 helix to push into the extracellular fluid and thereby add positive charges to the outside of the membrane. This movement of positive charges in the membrane repels positive charges in the extracellular fluid and generates a small current called a gating current. The gating current is evoked before the channel opens and thus it occurs before the ionic current that flows through the open channel. The upward displacement of the S4 segment is coupled to and thus opens the activation gate. Recall that the sodium channel has four domains and each domain has an S4 segment. The S4 segments only in domains 1, 2, and 3 have to move upward to open the activation gate. The behavior of S4 in domain 4 will be considered in a moment in conjunction with the operation of the inactivation gate. When the cell repolarizes, the negative charges on the inside of the cell then attract the positively charged S4 helix in each of the four domains, moving the segments downward, which in turn closes the activation gate. Hence, the activation gate is opened by depolarization and closed by repolarization. Open. Close. Next, we turn to the operation of the inactivation gate. Remember that activation of sodium channels is always followed by inactivation, where a second gate automatically closes and prevents ions from flowing through the pore even though the cell is depolarized. The four domains of a sodium channel, each composed of six segments, is shown in the figure above. Notice there is only one inactivation gate on sodium channels. The gate consists of a ball and two chains. The lower figure shows the channels embedded in the membrane. Only three domains, domain 1, 3, and 4, are shown, with the chains connected to domains 3 and 4. The ball has a unique amino acid sequence, the IFM motif, that is connected to intracellular linkages, the chains. But the particular amino acids that compose the ball are not of importance for our purposes. What is important is that the ball is positively charged. There are two other pieces of information that you need to know in order to understand how the ball and chain work. The first is the movement of the S4 segment in domain 4 is about a millisecond slower than the movements of the S4 segments in domains 1, 2, and 3. Recall that when the membrane is depolarized, the S4 segments in domains 1, 2, and 3 move simultaneously, which opens the activation gate. The S4 segment in domain 4 does not have to move to open the activation gate.
The second thing is that the movement of the S4 segment in domain 4 exposes negatively charged residues in the cytoplasmic region of the channel that's indicated in the upper figure. When these negatively charged residues are exposed, they attract the positively charged ball of the inactivation gate to the channel and plug the gate, thereby inactivating the channel. So here's how the gates work, step by step. Panel 1 is a cross-section of a sodium channel, showing only domains 3 and 4. The S4 segments in domains 3 and 4 are indicated by the arrows, and the ball and chain of the inactivation gate is at the bottom of the channel. The cell is at rest and the activation gate is closed because the S4 segments in all domains are in the resting positions. In panel 2, the membrane depolarizes, moving the S4 segments in domains 1, 2, and 3, which opens the activation gate. Sodium ions flow through the pore of the conductive channel. Notice that the S4 segment in domain 4 has not yet moved. Events a millisecond later are shown in panel 3. Now the S4 segment in domain 4 moves upward. The movement of the S4 segment causes the negatively charged residues to be exposed in the cytoplasmic region of the channel. That's indicated by the arrow. A moment later, the ball of the inactivation gate is attracted to the negative residues. The movement of the ball plugs the pore and inactivates the channel. Okay, let's put it all together and see it operate in slow motion. The membrane depolarizes, the S4 gates go up, gating current, the activation gate opens, influx of sodium, S4 in the main form moves up, exposes the negative residues, attracts all of the inactivation gate and the channel is now inactivated. The sodium channel is in an inactivated state here. Let's see how it reactivates. The membrane depolarizes, the S4 segments move down, the ball is removed from the pore, and the channel is now reactivated. So here we've considered the basic molecular structure of sodium channels. In the next movie, we consider the molecular structure of potassium channels.